Welcome to the Brett Snodgrass Podcast. Today, I have a very special person. This is my favorite guest I've ever interviewed in my entire life. I have anticipated this moment for years. Richard E. Simmons III is on with me today. He has transformed my life through his books and his teachings. You guys are not going to want to miss that. Before we get to Richard E. Simmons, make sure you go over to YouTube and subscribe to the Brett Snodgrass channel because we have new videos that come out each and every week, guys. So uh, make sure you do that. Now, who is Richard E. Simmons III? So Richard E. Simmons III wrote a book called The True Measure of a Man that transformed my life a few years ago. I've given out that book to men more than any other book in my entire life. Uh, it has transformed my life. He has also authored books titled uh, The Power of a Humble Life, uh, Wisdom, Life's Greatest Treasure, and his newest book, The Reflections on the Existence of God, which is a series of short essays proving that God exists. So he is wise. He is a research junkie. Uh, so he backs up all of his teaching with extreme evidence behind it. And now I cannot wait. Here is Richard E. Simmons III. What's going on, Richard? Not much, Brett. How you doing? I'm doing fantastic. And uh, it's just an honor uh, to be interviewing you today. I'm a huge fan, huge follower of all of your books. And I've read several. I know you've written several, but I've probably read at least five or six and listened to the Re Reliable Truth podcast every week. So it is an honor to have you on the show today. I really appreciate right. it. No, I appreciate that. Um, I know you really dive into men and especially professional men, executive men. And uh, we're going to talk a lot about that today, which, you know, I love to talk about faith and uh, just business leaders and how how we can kind of influence people in faith. Uh, but before we get into that, I always ask this very first question, and that is this. Who is Richard E. Simmons III? <laughs> well, I'm an old man to start with. <laughs> uh, in all seriousness, um, back tomorrow, I turn 68. But um, I, I've had a kind of an unusual life. I... Uh, started in the business world and in insurance brokerage business. I had a great job uh, the last 10 years uh, of that uh, stint. I was the CEO of our company. And, um, uh, but I got married at the age of 41 and I'd never been married before. And so we had children rather quickly just because my wife wanted me to be around to see our uh, children get married and, and have grandchildren. And I was traveling a lot. Uh, but I was, I, I was, I do a lot of uh, teaching, public speaking and writing books. And then I had a wife and three kids uh, in short order. So I had to make a decision. Something had to, had to go. And that's when uh, I felt very led to retire from my job and uh, start the center. It's called the Center for Executive Leadership. And that was 21 years ago. And it's been a great ride. Uh, I love what I do. Uh, even though I'm about to turn 68, um, I uh, I plan on continuing to do this uh, until they have to carry me out of here. So <laughs> we'll see how how long that lasts. But uh, that's that's who I am. Yeah, yeah. Well, I really appreciate uh, that. Such such an interesting story. And uh, I'm I'm also 41. Happy birthday, by the way, tomorrow, 68. Thank you. And uh, so so the very first book I read of yours was called The True Measure of a Man. And the story behind that was a very unusual story. I was at a marriage retreat with my wife. And so we're typically talking about marriage. And there was some books on the back there. And uh, and they're all about marriage, right? How to have an amazing marriage and Christian marriage. But the, the man, the husband, stood up. He said, hey, this book is not about marriage, but it changed my life. And it's wow. back there, too, if you want to buy it. So... When I hear, you know, I hear, oh, this book was really good, really interesting. But when I hear a book changed my life, it really intrigued me, especially a book about men. So I picked that up and I, and I bought that book and I read that and it was awesome. It really impacted me. But I thought, you know, it's maybe just me. Uh, I, I don't know. But my dad's birthday came around and he was turning about 66, 67 years old and and I said, I don't know what to get my dad for his birthday. So I said, oh, I have this book. I'm going to give him this book. And a couple months went by, and I asked my dad, hey, dad, did you read that book? And he said, not only did I read it, 
but I bought 20 copies to give to all of my friends. And I said, man, I don't know what it is, but there's something about this book, The True Measure of a Man. So I want to talk about that. I know this book was written a decade plus ago, but let's talk about that. What was your inspiration behind writing this book, The True Measure of a Man? Well, it's kind of interesting. Um, uh, I speak, um, in fact, that 10 years ago, I was speaking once a month uh, at this venue. In fact, it's the, the, the largest country club in Birmingham. And we had scores of men coming uh, to it. And this was a time, you know, when the, the, the uh, you're talking about a lot of economic hardship, you know, back in 2010. Um, and I was, I'd been encouraged to, to really try to help men in this difficult time that we're in. And so I gave a series of talks, um, I think three or four in a row, and I titled it The True Measure of a Man. Mm. And the response was so powerful that I was getting uh, from people. I was, I was encouraged by a number of men to take this, the material, and somehow convert it into a book. And I had written two books prior to that or maybe three books, two, I can't remember, two or three books prior to that. So, uh, you know, I had someone that really could help me uh, do this, who would help me publish the other books. And so we converted it into a book. And it's kind of interesting, Brett, we sell, it, it was self-published. And we sold so many books, we, we decided, let's, let's go after a publisher. Mm. And we found a, a, a publisher that, uh, that wanted it and, and, and bought the rights to it. And really, it, it I mean, we still, I can't tell you how many copies of that book we still sell. Mm. And so it, it, and I'll tell you one other thing, since you just said this, um, I had a women's group read it because this woman that I know uh, was, her husband was a basketball coach and she read it. She says, I finally understand my husband. I understand him in a way that I've never uh, understood him before. And so that, I found that interesting and I, I, I get it. And I think that's true because I think sometimes our wives don't understand uh, what drives us as men. They don't understand our fears and usually we won't, we won't talk about them to uh, our spouses, which we should. Um, <laughs> but uh, anyway, yeah, it's, uh, I, I've, I've, been, I've been really kind of shocked at how well the book's done, but I think I understand now as, as time has gone by that it really speaks into the lives of men. Yeah, yeah. Well, it really speaks into my life. And my dad was a high school basketball coach too, by the way. So there, there's a little, there's a little history in the Snodgrass family for you. Uh, but so this book obviously dives into, to men and mostly into, you know, all men, I believe, but it really dive into me. I'm an entrepreneur, business owner, business leader. So it really spoke to me on your identity, your performance, the achievement, everything, right? That that just entails. So, uh, and I know that you have the Center of Executive Leadership in Birmingham. And so I want to ask you this. You meet with a lot of business professionals. And so what are like some of the biggest challenges, like the most common, maybe one could be the biggest challenge or two biggest challenges that a male business professional faces? Well, you know, I, th I think we go through seasons of life uh, as men. Uh, we, you know, you start your career and you're, and you're in your 20s um, and then you start advancing uh, in your 30s and, um, and then, you know, your 40s and 50s. But early in a man's career or early in a man's life, uh, and I'm talking about his business life. Uh, one of the greatest uh, struggles that men have is the, the fear of failure. Um, it, it's amazing how e even very successful men uh, struggle with this. I had a guy, he's one of the probably most successful commercial realtors uh, in Birmingham. He shared with me, um, he said, every day that my feet hit the floor, I'm driven by one thing, the fear of failure. Mm. And I was shocked because he's done exceptionally well. I mean, he's a very wealthy man. And yet it's still, it's something that, that, that he, he struggles with. Mm. Um, I, I think if you take that a little further, men struggle with also um, the issue of what do other people think about me? And that's, it, it, that kind of gets down into the issue of shame which, which is connected to the fear of failure. Cause if I fail, you know, I, I what are people going to think about me mm -hmm. as a man? 
because that's the way so many men measure their lives is how well they do in business. And of course, what, by doing that, you're so many people are setting themselves up for devastation when something does happen where they do have a setback and they don't know how to deal with it. They don't know how to handle it. And so much of it gets back to, um, you know, what are people going to think about me, which leads also then to the issue of comparison. It's amazing how we compare how, how well we're doing with other people maybe uh, that we compete with or who are friends of ours. And the, and the problem with it all, Brett, is men carry this all around silently. Yeah. They don't talk to anybody about their struggles and it can make for a very difficult life and it can, it can, it can impact your uh, mental and emotional health. It's, it, 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 if you're not careful, you're going down a road that can really devastate you. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Well, you talk about the seasons of life and so explaining my life in my twenties and, and throughout my thirties, like I said, I just turned 41 and I'm starting to ask different questions than I used to ask. So what are you seeing when people reach certain seasons, forties, fifties, and I know you, you have different all age groups in right. the center, but right. what are some, how does the questions change? Yeah, I, I think, in fact, this is one of the reasons I started the center is that I saw this pattern in men's lives. Um, assuming they graduate from college or graduate school or law, law school or whatever. Um, most men uh, have a strategy for life. They have this kind of vision, I guess you could say, that, you know, I'm going to um, go out. I'm going to get a really good job. Uh, I'm going to make a lot of money. Uh, I'm going to marry the woman of my dreams. Uh, we're going to have great kids and we're going to live the American dream. And then what happens, and I've seen this so many times, um, a man gets to, let's just say midlife, 40 years old. And for so many of them, they begin to realize life has not turned out the way I thought it would. Um, work is hard. I don't care what kind of job you have is not easy. Um, marriage is difficult. Raising kids in this culture is difficult. And so this dream that they had of living the American dream doesn't come to pass. And it can cause all kind of disruptions in that person's life. And that's, Brett, that's when so often we get a hold of men and really help them understand uh, what is true success? Uh, what is the true measure of a man? Because when they're in their twenties, they're just, they're scrambling, they're working hard, but then you get to a certain point, it may be in your mid thirties or your early forties. And you begin to realize my life just hadn't turned out the way I had planned for it to turn out. And it, it can be a, a real jolt in a man's life. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Uh, I'm seeing that all over with, with, in my sphere as well uh, in your book. And you've even talked about this just recently on the podcast too. Uh, you talk about um, just life and the purpose of life. And in your book, you quoted George uh, Gilder and he said that men lust, but they know not what for they fight and compete, but they forget the prize. They chase power and glory, but miss the meaning of life. So you talk about this meaning of life uh, a lot, right? Um, I think you just did a, a, a series on this, the meaning of life, searching for this this meaning. So can you dive into that a, a little bit? Give us some feedback on, because I know you're a researcher too, and I, I love your teachings. I mean, you really hit home with your research. So talk about this, like why this burning question, meaning of life. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> um... Well, I, there's so much I could say. Let me, I'll, I'll try to be brief. Um, I think everyone, as time goes by, particularly as we get into adulthood, we ask the question, um, why am I here? What is, what is the reason for my life? And, you know, I think it's easy to, be, to believe that, you know, my purpose is to go out and, and, and earn a living, make a good, you know, a good life for my family but life is so much more than that. And so I spend a lot of time talking about the, I've written a lot about it. In my most recent book that came out, I, there's a, a section on 
uh, purpose and meaning. And, um, you know, we can't live life effectively if we're not living with a sense of purpose. And ultimately, the question that, that I try to confront men with is, in fact, I've written a real short book on it called The Reason for Life. Why did God put me here? And that to me is the big challenge is to understand why am I here? Because once I can determine that and then uh, integrate it into my life, it'll change everything. It'll even impact my work. And of course, this is where uh, I think that the, uh, you know, the Christian life comes in is to ask God, why did you put me here? And when you look at the Bible, there's two reasons uh, that we're given two, I call them two clues that we're given. Mm-hmm. Uh, the first clue is that we're designed in the image of God. In other words, we are like God in so many ways. We're not a God, but we uh, possess a number of his characteristics, and we're the only creatures that do. We can think, reason, and be creative. Um, we're relational beings, um, and that's a, that's a key component of, of, of being designed in the image of God is that we were made to be relational. Uh, that's the heart of life. The second clue is most important, and most people are not aware of it. But we're told in 1 Corinthians 8, 6, that we exist for him. Mm. And there's a lot of other scripture on that. But ultimately, God says, I made you relational, and I made you for myself. And so that becomes, that really answers the question, why are we here? And we are here to be in relationship with God. And then also be in good quality relationships with others. And when you, when you connect with him and you have good, healthy relationships with say in your family, when your friendships and your work and your with your colleagues, that's the key to finding meaning. And it's also, I think a key to finding happiness in life. Mm. Um, And it ultimately impacts every area of your life, including uh, the issue of masculinity. Uh, when God put us here as men, uh, there's there's a, I guess you could say there's a there's there's God's standard for masculinity, and then there's man's standard, which I call false masculinity. And God, as we grow in this relationship, He makes us into the type of men that we really want to be and really ought to be. Yeah, yeah. I, that... I, I, I could go down a lot of different paths with this, but. I'll stop and see what else you might want to talk about in relation to that or anything. No, else. no, it's good. You actually dive into it a lot, guys. So go check out Richard's uh, podcast, Reliable Truth. Uh, there was a series on there that I thought was amazing called The Meaning of Life. So check that out. Um, so, Richard, just two questions just relating to that. So let's just talk about false sense of masculinity. And you dive into this book, uh, d- into this topic in your book as well. And um, you quote another book uh, about the football coach, Ehrman, Coach was a ermine and then he talks about just even as a young boy that we just get defined as what is a a good boy what is a, a, a real man right um and we learn that on the ball field and then it goes in to the bedroom and then into the billfold and you've talked about this uh in your book and uh in your podcast so can you just dive into that a little bit like um just our culture and, and defining this this masculinity and, and you call it the false masculinity. Yeah. The, the book that you mentioned uh, had a real impact on me by Joe Ehrman, who was an all pro football player with the Baltimore Colts. And he does, he talks about false masculinity, but he starts by saying, you know, I kind of, this is kind of funny. If you, Cause I can kind of picture this. He does these men's retreats. And when he opens the retreats, he hands out a, uh, an index card. And, 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 a, uh, and a pen. And he says, I want every one of you to write down what is true masculinity. And he says, he, he watches them. He'll sit there and watch them. He says, most of them are clueless. And he says, for some of them, it's like uh, looking at a deer in the headlights. They, they have no idea what to write. And so he says, if a man can't define masculinity, how do you teach your son what manhood is? Mm-hmm. And, you know, he says, so often a father might say to his son, you need to be a man. Um, And the son has no idea what that is because the father's never really taught him because men in our culture don't know what true masculinity is. 
And so you're absolutely correct. He says it starts for a young boy when he when he's you know in in second, third, fourth grade, and they fought, you know they're competing out on the ball field, whatever sport they might be uh, playing. And the guys that are elevated and are thought of most highly are those who are the best athletes. But then you have those kids who are not good athletes, and that's you know that's that's a reality. So what does that mean to them? Mm -hmm. I mean, here you are, maybe ten or eleven years old, and you're beginning to wonder about your your manhood, so to speak. <laughs> and then you know you get to the point where you hit puberty, and you be begin to take interest in young ladies, and we then begin to measure ourselves based on how well do we do with, with women. And that's how he came up. We started with the ball field to the bedroom, and then it carries on into your twenties and thirties. And, and, and he says the billfold or the bank account, whatever you want. And, and we're all, it, it, when it comes to whether it's athletics, whether it comes to relationships with females or whether it comes to uh, our, our work and our, our achievement, in our work, that's the way we end up measuring ourselves by how well we do there. And so you can imagine that so many young, young boys, young men end up, don't, they don't feel like that they're very manly because they weren't good athletes or maybe they, they didn't attract uh, uh, females. Mm -hmm. And so think about what that does when you, as you move into adulthood and it's so it's devastating. And that's why, I really, one of the reasons I wrote the book was to be able to teach men what is true masculinity, because ultimately uh, that is so important to get and then to become a real man. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. Well, can you dive into that a little bit? Uh, I, I have a last question at the end of the show here, just about defining what is the true measure of a man. Before we talk about that, uh, true masculinity to you. Yeah, um, you know it's interesting. The 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 the, the, uh, the gentleman that published the book, uh, he interviewed me, uh, and the final thing he said to me was, or the final question he asked me, well, so what is the true measure of a man? And I said, well, very simply, uh, Christ likeness. Mm. Um, and then I went into what Christ likeness is, which is, I believe, is the true measure of a man, and I can. Uh, I can expound on that if you want me to, or if we can go in a different direction, if you'd like. No, let's go ahead. Let's go ahead. I'm sure listeners out there, what is your, when you say Christ likeness, how do you achieve yeah, it? First, let me, let me share this, Brett, yeah. and it'll lead, it'll lead into the answer. Um, one of my favorite uh, verses in the Bible is Romans 8, 28, that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love him and are called according to his purpose. And I always thought that was a great verse because whatever is going on in my life, God is causing it to work together for my good. Mm -hmm. The problem I had was what does the word good mean? Mm -hmm. Because in my mind, the ultimate good of life is my success, my, you know, how prosperous I am. Uh, and it was several years later that some after really diving in and, 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 uh, and studying that verse and memorizing that verse that somebody pointed out what the good actually is. And that's in the next verse, verse 29. And it, it, it talks about that we would be conformed to the image of his son. Mm. And so I then began to wonder what Christ likeness meant because initially I didn't find that very appealing because I didn't have much of a view of Jesus at the time. Uh, this was early. This is my early twenties. You know, I thought Jesus was just kind of a real religious guy. Uh, he didn't uh, have a lot of fun. He didn't laugh much, but, but the more I've studied his life, I realize he's everything that I would want to be. Mm. And the three, the, the, the three primary characteristics that I think make up a true man or, or, or the true measure of man. The first has to do with your character. The second has to do with the wisdom you possess. And the third has to do with your ability to love and have deep substantive relationships. That's what real manhood is all about. And our culture does not teach that. Mm. Um, character, uh, you know, character education is, uh, is not taught in schools. Um, wisdom, I don't believe is valued very much. That's why I wrote a book on it. Uh, but then I, going back to our relationships, uh, you know, that's, that's the, uh, 
that's the substance of life is the relationships we have with God and the relationships we have with others. Um, um, and if we, we don't love well, then we won't have good relationships. Yeah. And I want to dive into that uh, as we kind of wind down the show here is, is your relationships. So I work with a lot of entrepreneurs, business leaders. One of the things that really just hits me in the face is that men in that position are very lonely. They're very lonely men. And when I started to look around myself and I started to ask, do I have any real authentic relationships? And I started to really question, I don't know if I have any <laughs> right? Yep. Is yeah. that is that the same thing that, that you're finding that men look around and are like, I don't know if I have any real relationships? Yeah. Um, it's, it's funny that you, or it's ironic that you asked that question because I'm getting ready to write a blog. I'll, I'll probably wait until I'll do it after Christmas about the issue of loneliness. Um, loneliness plagues our land. And uh, I've just done some research on it. Uh, in fact, Joe Ehrman even says in his book, most men don't have one true, genuine friend that they're really, really close to. They have a lot of acquaintances. Mm -hmm. They know a lot of people, but nobody really knows them and they don't know anybody else at a, at a deep level. And I think there's uh, a number of reasons for that. Uh, one is, is that we, we, we want to keep our defenses up. Uh, we don't want to be vulnerable. We don't want to be transparent because if you, if I share with you my re any of my weaknesses and the, the things I struggle with, what would you think of me? Would you think I'm a man? Would you want to have anything to do with me? So most men feel like they've got to put up this front in order to impress other men in order to be liked. But in the process, they don't ever let anybody into their lives and therefore nobody ever really knows them and they end up being lonely and they can't figure out why. And so what I suggest and what I've done, we've been doing this for 20 years. I have three close friends um, and we meet regularly. Um, we don't meet as often as we probably would like, um, but we meet, you know, every month or every two months. And we, uh, we share with each other what's going on in our lives. And um, these guys now are, I mean, they're like brothers almost. We, in fact, we all had dinner Sunday night together with our wives at my house. And, um, um, and we did it to celebrate my birthday. And we've, we've been doing this for 30 years now, uh, every December. And so we have a camaraderie and a friendship that uh, transcends just having a bunch of acquaintances. So I'm grateful for that. But we had to be intentional in doing that. Yeah. Um, and so... The best way to start off, find some man that you that you consider a friend and then, uh, you know, seek to spend some quality time talking about issues that you all both face. And then who knows, maybe add a third. And it's amazing what it'll do to uh, the, the, the friendships that you have with those guys. Yeah. Hey, Amen. I think you had uh, Jerry Leachman on the, the podcast and he spoke it at the center quite a few times and he called them yep. casket carriers. Do you have any yep. casket carriers? <laughs> People are going to carry your casket. So I love that. That's um, right. <laughs> well, well, thanks, Richard. Richard, I know you've written uh, a lot of books. Like I said, I've, I've read many of them. You talked about the book Wisdom, Life's Greatest Treasure, The Power of a Humble Life, which I love reading all of your blogs and your books on humbleness and pride. Um, that, those are awesome. And you have a new, your newest book, I think, is The the Reflections on the Existence of God. And of course, The True Measure of a Man, which I always give out every podcast guest. I send them a copy of The True Measure of a Man if it's a man. <laughs> but I don't think I should send that to you because <laughs> you are the author. Anyways. I, I don't need that. But I <laughs> Anyways, I, I was just wondering, though, what, which one of those, which book has been your favorite book that you've worked on? Uh, probably, uh, that's, you know, that's really kind of hard. The most recent one has been the most important to me. It's called Reflections on the Existence of God. Uh, I wanted to write a, a really well-researched book, and I, I really worked on that book for 30 years, collecting uh, uh, information and teaching. And I really wrote it for my kids. It's a, it's, and I, like I said, I wanted one, a book that was well-researched, but it had to be easy to read because most books on the existence of God are difficult to read. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, but I want it for my kids because, you know, we are growing, our culture today is becoming more and more secular and there are more and more people who don't believe in God. 
And, you know, Christians are challenged and will continue to be challenged on why we believe what we believe. And, but we need to be able to engage with the culture. And let me just say this, Brett, that the evidence for the existence of God is compelling. Mm. It's very difficult to refute the evidence, but most people don't know what the evidence is. And so I laid it out in a way that was easy to read. I will say one other thing. Uh, the book, the, uh, the Power of a Humble Life, was also one of my favorites. And it's really, if you, it's really part two to the true measure of a man, because the last part of the true measure of a man has to do with the power of humility in a person's life. Yeah, yeah. I love that. I've read, and I've read that book uh, as well. And I've also read the reflections on the existence of God, which is amazing. And so if you're out there, you're listening and you're like, I don't know if, if, if there is a God, this is a very well-researched book, a lot of evidence and it's easy to read short essays. Uh, so love that. So, yeah. so thanks Richard. I always like to uh, end every show with a little fun round. So this is, this is your fire round here today. So number one, who's your favorite author? Tim Keller. Yeah, that's a good one. All right. Uh, where do you do most of your research? Um, when you say where, are you talking about? Yeah, like or how, how how do you do most of your research? You are you have a lot of research that you do, especially on this latest okay. book. I, but I, uh, I do it through books, and I have a system of categorizing as I read something that to, to, to be able to collect it and save it. Um, when I'm writing my books and really doing the research, I usually – um, I usually go to the beach and do that. Um, I, I just think that just seems to be a good place for me to do a lot of work. And, uh, and then of course, having the technology to be able to go and get information, uh, just makes it so much easier than it did, you know, 20 years ago when I was first writing my first book. Yeah, definitely. Uh, how long does it typically take you to write a book? Maybe take the last one off. Cause I know that was a very well researched, but true, right. you know, any of your other books, how long does it about take <laughs> It, it, it doesn't take as long as you might think, because the fact that I am a speaker and a teacher, for instance, The Power of a Humble Life, I did a bunch of teaching on humility. I did a series on humility, and I was able to take that. And then I, then I would go and, and, and do more research, but I already kind of had an outline of what the book would be mm -hmm. based on the teaching, just kind of like The True Measure of Man, as I mentioned uh, a little while ago. Yeah. And so um, I... I I'm going to write another book. I'm planning this summer, God willing, to write a book called Reflections on Happiness. Mm. And it'll be a short, uh, uh, in fact, I've, I've done a lot of work on that already. I did it this past summer, and I'll hope to do the book this coming summer. And I found, uh, just like the Wisdom Book and Reflections on the Existence of God, they're both a series of short essays. And each essay takes five or ten minutes to read. And people really like that. Yeah, They really do. And so I'm, I'm finding that... Uh, uh, so much of my work is going to be in that kind of format. Awesome. All right. Last question. This is maybe kind of an interesting one. What are okay. right, you work at the director of the center of executive leadership and working with men for over 21 years. What's the least favorite thing about what you do? Um, the least favorite thing about what I do. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think, uh, fundraising is probably the least favorite thing I do, but I've got to do it in order to keep pay our bills and what have you. So, um, but I, I'll be honest at this stage, it's not that difficult because so many of the men that are involved understand that we're a nonprofit and that you have to, um, uh, you know, we, we live off the support and, and the donations that we receive from them. And so, um, it's not as hard as it used to be, yeah. to be quite honest. Yeah. Sounds good. Well, that's all I got for you, Richard. Appreciate being on the Breast Snodgrass right. really podcast. I really, really enjoyed it. And uh, it's good to see you again. And uh, good luck to you. Yep. You too, Richard. Thank you. Thank you so much for checking out the Brett Snodgrass channel. If you like this video, please slam on that like button. And if you really like it, then subscribe to our channel here. And remember to leave us a comment below, and I'm going to try my hardest to reply to all the comments. Thank you guys so much. This is why I do what I do. Every single week, I come out with content that focuses on success, freedom, and living out your purpose. Thank you guys so much. See you next time.